Hi everyone, this is Dan Clanton, and this is our mini lecture over Hebrews and supersessionism. What we're going to try and do in this PowerPoint is to introduce you to the New Testament text called Hebrews, examine a key section or two from that text, and talk about the theological idea of supersessionism, which has its roots in this and other ancient Christian texts. In his work, New Testament scholar Bart Ehrman makes two important points for us about Hebrews. Now, this has traditionally been called the letter of Paul to the Hebrews, but as Ehrman notes, this is not a letter. Instead, it was originally a sermon or homily delivered by a Christian preacher to his congregation. Second, it doesn't claim to be written by Paul. Like the New Testament Gospels, it's anonymous, but it came to be included in the canon only after Christians of the 3rd and 4th centuries became convinced that Paul had written it. Hebrews also addresses a central question, how do followers of Jesus view their Jewish roots? As we know all too well, though, sometimes when one group defines itself, they define who they are over and against another group or groups. And that's the case here in Hebrews 8. As Daniel Harrington writes, this passage was key to the development of supersessionist ideas that still persist within the church. Namely, the notion that Christianity has superseded Judaism and that Christians compose the only true Israel. The importance of pointing out this supersessionist reading of Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, is that in the process of defining a particular kind of early Christian identity, this reading does rhetorical violence to Jews and Jewish texts and is often coupled with other New Testament texts to justify or rationalize persecution of and violence against Jews. Before we delve into that further, let's answer an important question. What exactly is supersessionism? Let me give you two helpful definitions. First, Henry Clayman defines supersessionism as the belief that the coming of the Messiah Jesus Christ rendered Judaism obsolete. Similarly, Jesper Schwartvik writes, the word supersessionism describes the influential idea that Christians, the people of the New Covenant, have replaced Jews, the people of the Old Covenant, as the people of God. In his work, Clayman also helpfully lists three tenets of supersessionism, that is, ideas or claims which are commonly found in numerous early Christian texts. First, Christianity replaced Judaism as God's chosen revelation. Second, Judaism was a necessary prelude to Christianity. And third, the Hebrew Bible foretells the coming of Christ. Clayman also notes three key questions regarding early Christian biblical interpretation related to Christianity's Jewish origins. These questions will become more and more important for early Christian authors to address as early Jesus followers move further and further away from these Jewish origins. First, if Judaism were obsolete, why didn't the new faith reject Jewish scriptures? That is, what's the point in keeping and referring to Torah? Second, if Christians didn't consider Jewish scriptures obsolete, how did they regard them? Are they a relic, a holdover, or are they somehow meaningful for Jesus' followers? Third, as Christians develop their own canon of holy texts, how did they foresee the relationship between the two Bibles? Now let's look at two specific texts in Hebrews to see how one early Christian text exemplifies this process of identity formation vis-a-vis -vis their Jewish origins. First, let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 7, and we're going to focus on uh, chapter 7, verse 22. Note that here in chapter 7, the author is focusing on a rather obscure story from Genesis 14 about a fellow named Melchizedek, uh, 
who's called a priest of God and who's blessed by Abraham. Since this happens long before the establishment of the traditional Levitical priesthood, the author of Hebrews argues that this kind of priesthood is inferior and temporary. Jesus, though, is superior, as the author has argued strongly in chapters 1 to 5, and eternal, as the author tells us in chapter 7, verse 24. As such, Jesus is a better kind of priest, one who doesn't need to offer sacrifices day after day, because this he did once for all when he offered himself in chapter 7, verse 27. Thus, Jesus is the guarantee of a better covenant in chapter 7, verse 22. Now let's take a look at chapter 8. We've mentioned chapter 8 earlier, but let's go into a little bit more detail here. This emphasis on Jesus as a priestly figure is carried over from chapter 7 into chapter 8, and here the author gets even more explicit about Jesus' superiority, writing, Jesus has now obtained a more excellent ministry, and to that degree he is the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted through better promises. We find this in verses 6 to 7. This better covenant is fleshed out by the author, quoting Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34, in full. It might help to know a little of the historical and literary context for this passage. Jeremiah 31 stems from the Babylonian exile in the 6th century BCE, which occurs after the destruction of Judah and Jerusalem and the temple in around 587 by the Neo-Babylonian Empire under the leadership of Nebuchadnezzar. Jeremiah chapters 30 to 31 has traditionally been known as the Book of Consolation, as this section contains promises and prophecies of comfort, reassurance, and a return from that exile. In his work, Walter Brueggemann describes the theological importance of this new covenant at this point in Israel's history, writing, in the midst of that dread circumstance of divine abandonment, however, emerges an unexpected, inexplicable eruption of prophetic poetry. Termination of the covenant is not God's final word to Israel. A number of passages in Jeremiah 30 to 31 address a bereft Israel, declaring that God is now prepared in the abyss of dislocation to make a new beginning with Israel. The oracle of Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, utters a new resolve on God's part to re-engage Israel in covenant, even though Israel had forfeited such a possibility. Now, obviously, because of its focus on simultaneous continuity with the past and newness, as well as the idea of writing the covenant on people's hearts, this new covenant imagery found fertile ground amongst early Jesus followers who were questioning how they should relate to their Jewish origins. As Bergman puts it, Christians quickly took the new covenant to be a reference to the graciousness of God given in Jesus, who was taken as a gift and a sign of God's readiness for newness. In this tradition, the new covenant in Christ is contrasted with the old covenant of Moses. And this is despite the fact that Jeremiah's oracle is in no way an anticipation of what became the claim made in Christian tradition. Nevertheless, the author of Hebrews concludes this section by noting in chapter 8, verse 13, that this language of new covenant means that the first one is obsolete and will soon disappear. This use of Jeremiah 31 in Hebrews chapter 8 exemplifies another important development that will become a defining transformation in the history of Christianity, the transformation of Torah into Old 
Testament. The three questions that Clayman raises, which I mentioned just a minute ago, reflect the difficulty some early Christians had in thinking through how they wanted to understand the Jewish scriptures they inherited. Eventually, those Jewish scriptures are appropriated by Christians and are transformed into what we now call the Old Testament. The logic of this transformation looks something like this. Some Jesus movements begin to see their own literature as scripture, even on a par with Torah. And we see evidence of this in 2 Peter chapter 3. Second, texts that serve as a testament or witness to this new covenant that Jesus mediates would obviously be valued. But the theology of supersessionism would require Torah and other Jewish texts to be seen as a testament or witness to the old covenant. Thus, Torah becomes the Old Testament. The name itself gives away the assumption behind this transformation that the formerly Jewish scriptures are now representative of an older relationship in Revelation that has now been fulfilled and superseded. Coming back to Hebrews, let's go broad and let me mention how New Testament scholar Bert Ehrman describes what he sees as the overall message of Hebrews. Now, the connection to our interest in identity formation should be obvious from what Ehrman writes, and he makes three points. First, the author of Hebrews is writing to demonstrate to his audience that Christianity is superior to Judaism. Second, for this author, Christ does indeed stand in continuity with the religion of the Jews as set forth in their sacred writings, but he is superior to that religion in every way, and those who reject the salvation that he alone can provide are in danger of falling under the wrath of God. Third and finally, those outside the Christian faith, whether Jews or Gentiles, could not legitimately claim to be the heirs of the religion espoused by Moses, for that religion looked forward to what was to come. It was but a foreshadowing of the salvation that God had promised the prophets, a salvation brought in the person of his son Jesus, the Messiah. In this sense, the Christian religion was continuous with, but ultimately superior to, the religion of non-Christian Judaism. And Christians were not to yield to the temptation of preferring the foreshadowing of salvation to salvation itself. It's also important to remind ourselves that the imagery and interest in supersessionism in Hebrews isn't the only example we have in early Christian literature. For example, this position is also central to texts like the Epistle of Barnabas, probably written in the early 2nd century CE. In his work, Michael Holmes notes that in Barnabas chapters 4 and 14, the author argues that Christians are the true and intended heirs of God's covenant, not Jews. Tobias Nicholas elaborates on this, noting Barnabas doesn't just develop the idea that Israel has lost its status as a chosen people after the rejection of Jesus. According to Barnabas, this happens much earlier, immediately after the covenant was given. That is, there's never been a successful covenant between God and Israel. Earlier, I mentioned some of the questions Henry Clayman raises that early Christian texts had to start answering once those groups move further and further away from their Jewish roots. Connected with these questions, as well as with the claims in both Hebrews and Barnabas, is what Judith Liu calls the problem of the Jews for early followers of Jesus. And it's worth quoting Liu at length here. She writes, Jews are a real problem for a number of second century Christian writers and occupy writings of every genre. Yet curiously, the Jews whom these writers attack are not members of the synagogue across the marketplace. 
the Jews of the past, of Scripture. The reason for this focus on the Jews of Scripture in Christian writings is evident, and it's not disputed. The Christians claim to revere as Scripture the same texts as did the Jews. They claimed to be heirs of God's promises through the prophets of the biblical tradition. Some even claimed to be the true Israel, the authentic people of God. Yet the Christians didn't observe the law as prescribed in Scripture. They didn't observe Sabbath or circumcision, sacrifice or purity. And so they defended themselves by seeking to prove that such practices were not God's intention, perhaps never had been. That observance of them was not a sign of piety, but impiety. The Jews of the Old Testament, as Christians came to call it, are the opponents for Christian apologists because the Old Testament was a problem. This construction of an artificial Judaism with straw man Jews is evident in Hebrews, as Liu notes, as well as in one of the most influential Christian writings about Judaism. John Chrysostom's late 4th century sermons, subsequently titled, The Discourses Against Judaizing Christians. Chrysostom also claimed that even though Jews have the scriptures, they don't read them correctly or follow them. That is, they rejected the blessings which were sent to them. Now, we could say an awful lot more about Chrysostom, or Barnabas, or especially Hebrews, but let me wrap this up, and in conclusion, let me make five brief points. First, the question of how Jesus movements understand their Jewish origins is absolutely key to the process of identity formation in the early church. Secondly, different texts answer that question differently. Some texts, which we assume represent some communities, value and honor those Jewish origins. And some, unfortunately, like the texts that we talked about in this lecture and other texts, primarily the Gospel of John, they answer that question quite differently. So supersessionism isn't the only response that we can find in early Christian literature. Fourth, supersessionism became one of the bedrock beliefs in anti-Semitism, which unfortunately is still a prevalent discourse today. And that's why, number five, it's so important for us to understand the development and origin of supersessionism as a theological position because of its continuing vitality. I hope that this has been helpful, and I look forward to hearing your comments.